It had been three years since we had tied the knot and become Mr. and Mrs. Dave and Molly Jacobs, and if you asked either of us about our relationship, we would tell you a bit of a different story on the status of our marriage. Molly would say the sex was fantastic, the friendship and love between us was very strong and she couldn't imagine being married to a better person. However, the biggest problem to her was the lack of money and unfortunately, she couldn't see a path to where we would ever be able to have the things that she really wanted in life. You see, Molly had grown up poor. So poor that her family couldn't even afford an occasional nice dinner out. So poor that all of her clothes were either made by her mother or purchased secondhand at the thrift shop. So poor that she couldn't afford a bicycle when she was young or couldn't afford to go to the movies, join any after-school clubs, go out with friends on the weekend. In short, she was constantly frustrated at the lack of any money to spend on herself, and she was jealous of her friends at school that always seemed to get whatever they wanted. Molly swore that one day she would have all the nice things in life and never want for anything. In her final year in high school, she met me, good old Steady Dave. I did have money, or at least my parents did. We lived in a nice neighborhood, had nice cars, and I was always dressed casual but in high-quality clothes. But from everything that Molly could tell, and from my attitude, she could see that I just didn't seem to care about money. I assured her that I didn't notice that she wore second-hand clothes. I swore to her that I saw her as the most beautiful and elegant girl in school. In hindsight, I can now see that she wasn't sure that I would end up being the guy who could take her out of her poverty, but after a while it didn't seem to matter as she loved my personality, loved how handsome and strong she thought I was, and loved what I did to her beneath the sheets. So, despite her concerns about whether we could obtain riches and ever live the upper-class life she desired, she fell in love with me, and she accepted my marriage proposal that I delivered on bended knee the day we both finished our AA degrees at the community college in town. Molly ended up getting a certificate in paralegal work, which she figured would give her an adequate and steady income, and although not getting her rich, she could at least buy reasonable clothes, go out to clubs and bars, and have the occasional night out at a good restaurant. I decided I would become a physical therapist, learning massage and occupational therapy exercises to help treat people with muscle pain or being rehabilitated from surgery or injury. It would never make me rich, but I loved the interaction with the people and I liked the work and the way it made me feel, helping people out of pain and misery. I also didn't want a job sitting at a desk all day long. What could be more boring? I realized that this wouldn't make us rich, and I knew that Molly had a lot of frustration about not being able to live the upper-class suburban life. But I really enjoyed our current life. Loved our sex life and the fact that we had so much fun hanging around together, no matter what we were doing. I also knew something that Molly didn't. My grandparents had been very rich, and when they died, they left my parents a sum of $15 million, and that sum was in a trust that they could draw upon until they passed away, at which time the trust would go to me. My father has passed away of a heart attack two years ago, and my mother had not fared well since his death. The last few years had been rough, but she still loved and missed him when he was gone. My mother was not at all interested in the trust fund, and in fact both she and I saw the money as being somewhat poisonous to life. My parents had such a strong bond and loving life together, and then my grandparents died and my dad got the money. It totally changed him, and not for the better. He quit work, started to drink and party bought fast cars and spent vast sums of money gambling and doing party and narcotics. I'm guessing an escort or two might have also happened, but I never knew that for sure and never asked my mom about that. His new lifestyle started to destroy their marriage and also his body. Within two years he had drank and partied himself to a horrible health, with the final death blow being a massive heart attack at a casino in Vegas. Both my mom and I had seen the money destroy his life, and neither one of us really wanted much to do with the life of luxury and temptation. We just wanted to keep our lives the way they were when we were a happy family, before dad fell to the temptations that unlimited money can bring. After his death, I made it a point to see mom at least every other week and try to get her interested in outside activities, travel, charity work. Basically, anything to get her out of her depression about dad's passing. But she told me to leave it alone. Her life was now about friends, church, and me, and she reminded me that the money did nothing but ruin my father. I had not told Molly about the trust knowing that she was overly motivated about money and possessions and I didn't want her to start buying things on credit, or start wishing for the demise of my mother, or have her spending all of her time thinking and hoping about a rich future and ignoring what we now had in our everyday loving life. Besides, it was hopefully years off in the future that my mother would pass and no reason to get Molly's hopes up about having a lot of money and seeing her potential greed kick in and alter either our relationship or get her even more frustrated with our current lifestyle. I could see my mother was lonely and depressed, and I finally figured out why when she told me she had been diagnosed with breast cancer and her future was not assured. 
but she really downplayed the potential severity of it, and I was kind of oblivious to that possibility. She didn't tell me that she might not have long to live as she didn't want me to cater to her and her needs when I was just establishing my own life with, in her words, my pretty young wife. Besides, mom thought, the doctors really couldn't predict or tell her much of anything, and she thought she would probably go on for years. The doctors thought they had caught the cancer with the lumpectomy and radiation and hadn't indicated to her that any demise was in her near future. Although one doctor did say that a few of her lymph nodes were found to be cancerous and therefore she needed to be highly attentive to any changes in health or any lumps or bumps that she noticed. As Molly and I approached our fifth year of marriage, I was totally content and happy with our lives. And although Molly loved me dearly and was content on a day-to-day -day basis, and the sex was fantastic as we made love four or five times a week, I knew she also longed for a day sooner than later when she could feel rich and not have to worry about money or working, and have some of the things that she had always coveted after when she was younger. Molly kept trying to improve her status at work in an attempt to get promoted and improve her salary and benefits. She worked for a well-respected and highly sought-after law firm, specializing in family law and divorce as well as real estate and taxes. The principal owner of the firm, Jay Sutter, was a 51-year old balding and somewhat paunchy man who had started the law firm 25 years ago and built it into the firm with the largest billings in the region. He had worked himself hard over the years and had neglected his personal life, never having married and having no kids or offspring to consume his time. Sutter's personal assistant was retiring, so he had posted the job internally for the various paralegals in the firm to have the first chance at this promotion before he sought candidates from the outside. Molly was his third and last interview for the position and she had told me how excited she was about the possibility. Dave, it would be a 20% increase right off the bat and a chance at a 10% bonus at the end of the year. I know it will be more hours and even some weekend work, but I really can't pass up the opportunity for promotion. Is it okay with you that I pursue this? Sure Molly, you are free to do whatever works for your career. Nothing is forever, and if it doesn't work out you can always find something else, but if you stick it out for a year or two it will look great on your resume and be a stepping stone for bigger things. The day of the interview Molly dressed in business attire, but left a strong hint of the incredible body and sex appeal that lurked just under the surface of her business outfit. She wore stockings and sexy high heels. This was not lost on Jay Sutter. Although he wanted to make sure that he had a qualified candidate, he thought he deserved to reward his hard work with some young and beautiful assistant who would be spending a lot of time with him. Molly had the qualifications, but more than that, when she left the interview and he watched her perfect body sachet away and out the door, he felt himself getting excited. It was at that moment that he decided she was the one. Molly came home extremely excited as she was told just before leaving the office that she was getting the job. She had been called into Mr. Sutter's office and he told her, Molly, you did a fine job of interviewing and your work record here has been excellent. I would like to offer you the job, but be aware that there will be many late nights and some weekends that you will be working very closely with me. Do you think that your personal life will allow that without exception? Oh yes, Mr. Sutter. I don't have any kids and my husband often has to work at night too, fitting in clients after work for massage and physical therapy. This will work very well for me and I am so grateful, Mr. Sutter. I won't let you down. Well, excellent. But Molly, call me Jay. We will be working closely together and I prefer a casual and open relationship with my assistant. Feel free to talk to me about anything and everything and I'll do the same. When Molly walked in the door at home, she yelled for me, told me about getting the job and in a husky voice, asked me to sit on the couch. She looked at me with incredible excitement and joy about getting the job, and she told me she wanted me to celebrate with her. To that end, she stood in front of me and slowly started to spin and dance a bit as she took off her clothes. I was spellbound and loved it when Molly got into these hyper-excited moods, so I wasn't about to argue. When we were finished, she laid face down on the couch. I got up and moved over to the sitting chair and leaned back enjoying the feeling of bliss that always came over me after having wild sex with Molly. Molly flipped over onto her back, still laying on the couch and said, Davy, that was incredible. I sang it like the Little Richard tune and she laughed and slapped at my shoulder and said, Okay stud, go wash yourself up and let's make some dinner. As the weeks went by and Molly got immersed in her job, she would tell me how incredibly smart and observant her boss, Jay was. She told me how he dressed in the fanciest Brooks Brothers suits, how he wore one of three different Rolex watches every day, and how his shoes cost more than ten of her outfits combined. She said he was funny, articulate, and treated her like she was the smartest and most capable personal assistant he had ever had. None of this bothered me, as I was confident in our marriage and had trust in my wife. Besides, she told me he was a balding, fat 51-year-old, 
so it didn't seem like much of a competition. At least none of it bothered me at first. But after a month of this, she soon didn't talk about Jay anymore, and she didn't talk about work. When I would bring up any conversation about how her day was, she would avert any eye contact, just nod and say work was fine, and then quickly change the subject. Molly started to work later each evening, and soon she wasn't getting home until 8 p.m. on three or four days a week. I decided to ask her what the deal was and why she would come home, jump in the shower, and then just about beg me to screw her before we would have any dinner or sit down to talk. When she climbed off of me and we recovered I looked at her and blurted out, Molly, what's going on with you? You come home late, grab a shower at night, even though you had one in the morning, and then practically tear me apart with our lovemaking. You never want to talk about work, but yet you are working late most nights and can't seem to tell me what you are doing that takes so much time. If I didn't know how much you loved me, I would think maybe you were having an affair. Davy, don't even say that. You know how much I love you and I just can't get enough of you. When I come home, I am so excited for your incredible lovemaking that I can hardly wait to have you get me off. My sex drive seems to have increased a lot, and I make sure to take a shower so that the sweat and the grime of the workday gets washed off, so you can kiss me all over, everywhere, as only you can do. Really there isn't much to tell you about work. I just end up taking dictation and typing up documents and memos and do the billing for my boss. He has so many meetings during the day that he can finally sit down and crank out the work from 5 o'clock on. After most of the other employees have left him alone. Remember when I got the job, he told me and I told you that there would be a lot of late nights and now we both understand just what he meant. She kind of looked away and couldn't seem to make eye contact with me as she told me all of this. And for the first time I thought that things weren't right. But I figured that was as far as this conversation was going. So I just dropped it and determined that I would be more attentive than usual to what was going on. I was usually the first one up and out the door in the morning, given that many of my clients wanted their massage or PT sessions before going into work. So most mornings I would get up before Molly, shower, and be out the door. That was the usual routine. But today I didn't have anything pressing. So I was drinking coffee and reading the paper when I heard a phone go off upstairs. It wasn't Molly's normal ringtone, and it certainly wasn't mine. I quietly moved to the bottom of the stairs and listened to her conversation as she picked up the phone and said, Oh hi Jay. How is my wonderful boss doing today? I couldn't hear the other part of the conversation, but I heard her laugh at whatever her boss said. I then heard her say, Yes, Jay. I miss you too, and can hardly wait to see what surprise you are talking about that you have for me when I get in. Now sweetie, let me jump in the shower and get ready for work and I'll see you soon. Did I hear her say sweetie? What the hell? Who calls their boss sweetie? And what surprise could her boss have for her? And what the hell was that ringtone I heard? When I heard the shower go on, I walked upstairs and saw that her purse was sitting on the bed and looking inside I saw a brand new iPhone, the latest model. These things go for almost $1,100 and she certainly didn't buy that herself. Besides which, it definitely wasn't being covered on our Verizon contract or I would see the charges for it. I tried to unlock the phone and see any text messages or incoming and outgoing calls, but it was password protected and none of the obvious passwords like birthday or anniversary date seemed to work. As I was putting the phone back, I also noticed a small jewelry box in her purse, and as I looked inside of it, I just about fell over. There were two one-carat diamond earrings that came from Cartier and Sons, so I couldn't even imagine how expensive those were but no way that Molly could ever afford that. Now I was really confused and starting to get pissed off. I quickly retreated to downstairs and sat quietly in the kitchen, waiting for Molly to get ready and come down the stairs. She would assume I was long gone by now, and when she came down the stairs, I had another huge surprise. She was dressed in a way too sexy dress for work, with a low neckline that allowed her cleavage to be seen when she bent over. She also had stay-up seamed stockings, and when she bent over slightly to rub something off the toe of her 4-inch heels. She thought I was gone, and when she turned around and saw me silently staring at her from the kitchen, she gasped. Oh my god Davy, you surprised me, she said as she blushed and quickly tried to hide her legs behind the kitchen island. What are you still doing home? I thought you would be off to work by now. That's obvious, I said as I walked around the island, grabbed her hand and spun her around in a circle. Are you going to work or going out to a club looking to pick up some stud? I said sarcastically. How the hell can you think about going to work dressed like that? And by the way, where did that outfit come from? Those are $500 shoes, and that dress and stockings probably cost $1,000? I also want to know what the hell is the deal with the new cell phone and the $5,000 earrings you have in your purse. What the hell Molly, are you stealing this shit? Or are you screwing someone? Molly looked at me and started to cry. She quickly turned and walked into the living room and sat down. Davy, please let me explain. It isn't like that at all. My love is only for you. No one else. 
So, you're telling me you're screwing someone else, but you don't love him? Davy, no, I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. I can explain this. I'm listening, but I warn you if you lie to me. I'm out of here. Davy, it's not what you think. I didn't tell you because I knew it would make you mad, and you would get the wrong idea. These are all work-related bonus items from my boss. He gave me the phone and called it a company phone so that he could get a hold of me whenever he needed to and that our calls would remain confidential and be password protected. The earrings were a gift for me working so many hours and doing such good work. He said he couldn't really change my salary or give me a cash bonus through the company, so he bought me the earrings. He also bought me some outfits and told me that he wants me to look a certain way at work and asked me to wear this. She looked at me apprehensively, seeing that I wasn't really buying it. Oh. Please Davy, you have to believe me, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just trying to make sure I do a good job and keep on his good side so that I can get promoted and move ahead in the company. Davy, you know that you are the man that I love. Jay Sutter could never compare in any way. I looked at her with pain, hurt and tears in my eyes and said, I think this is the first time you have actually lied to me Molly. I believe you are screwing your boss and he is giving you the gifts and luxury items you could never afford as a way of getting into bed with you. I think that's why you come home and shower immediately. And since when do you call your boss sweetie and tell him you can hardly wait to see him? Molly turned bright red and gasped and stuttered. But I cut her off and said, Molly, before you tell me more lies, I heard your phone conversation this morning, so don't even try to lie about that. I'm leaving and when, and if I come back you better be honest with me about what is going on. I turned and walked towards the door as Molly came running behind me screaming, God no, Davy, it isn't what you think. Please come back and let me explain. Please, I love only you. Oh God no, please let me show you. She ran up to me and tried to seduce me saying, You are my only sweetie and I'll show you how much I love you. I looked at her with disgust, pushed her hand away and yelled, Goodbye Molly, and then walked out the door. What the hell did she think that was going to solve? I didn't know where I was headed but got in my car and as I left, I saw Molly in my rearview mirror yelling for me to come back, crying and screaming that she loved me. I couldn't deal with her right now and was pretty sure she was lying to me. Perhaps our whole marriage had been lies. I needed time to think. I soon found myself driving to my mom's house. She was only 30 minutes away, and I kind of berated myself for not making visits more often. I called her weekly, but I only drove out to see her maybe once a month at most. I rationalized that you get busy in life. You get into routines, you try to deal with the job, the house, the chores, the wife. Yeah, the wife. Thinking about it brought the issue with Molly front and center. I didn't know for sure she was cheating on me, but what kind of boss would be doling out thousands of dollars of jewelry, clothes and a phone if he wasn't getting some in return? And even if Molly hadn't yet slept with him, his actions were totally inappropriate for any boss-employee relationship. If it hadn't turned to sex yet, it surely was his intent and just how long would it take, particularly given Molly's lust after the finer and more expensive things in life. I set all of these thoughts aside as I pulled into my mom's driveway. When I entered the house, it was quiet so I called out, Mom, are you here? I walked into the living room and saw mom laying on the couch with a bucket on the floor next to her. She turned to look at me and I could see the pain in her eyes. She looked very pale and sickly. She tried to raise herself up to a sitting position, but it was a losing effort. I ran over to her just as she had to turn her head, grab the bucket and vomit more into it. Tears were in her eyes when she settled back down on the couch pillow and took a shallow breath. Oh Davy, you surprised me. I didn't want you to see me like this. Mom, what's wrong? Do you have the flu? Have you seen the doctor? What can I get you? Here, let me clean out this bucket at least. I'll be right back. I took the putrid smelling bucket to the bathroom, flushed the vomit down the toilet, rinsed the bucket quickly in the shower and flushed it again and ran back to the couch. Mom, talk to me. What's wrong? Davy, just relax. I'm okay. I feel kind of ashamed that I didn't tell you on your calls the last few weeks, but I am going through chemo again. This is just the after effect. I have chemo now every Monday, and this is how my Tuesday through Thursday has been going. So, no I'm not sick, except of course for the cancer. It's come back and they are trying to beat it again. Oh no, shit. What is the doctor saying mom? Well Davy, he isn't saying much but if I read between the lines, he's not very optimistic. I'm going to really try and pin him down next week at my appointment, because if this chemo isn't going to work, I don't want to go through it anymore. If my days are numbered, I want them to be spent feeling good enough to get outside, do some gardening, see some friends, not lay on the couch vomiting. Oh, shit mom. I'm so sorry. You've got to beat this mom. I can't lose you. What can I do to help? 
When is the next appointment? I'm going with you. Davy, you have your own life to live now, so don't fret and spend your time with me. You have a beautiful young wife and a career to deal with. I'll be fine. Mom, you are an important part of my life, so being with you and helping you is dealing with my own life. Besides, I'm not sure about my beautiful young wife really being mine. I've caught her with over $10,000 of presents and gifts she has gotten from her boss recently. She tells me nothing is going on and he is giving her bonuses and material things to reward her for the good work and late hours she is spending, but I don't buy it. I think she is lying to me, and I need to get to the bottom of what's really going on. I walked out on her in a mad rage this morning and drove over to see you. No, Davy, I can't believe it. She loves you more than any woman seems to love a man. I can't believe she would ever cheat on you. Mom, Molly loves and lusts after material things. She has always been poor, grew up poor, and has always resented and been frustrated by not having the good things in life. I think she has deluded herself that to be truly happy you need to have money and surround yourself with the best clothes, the best jewelry, the best house and car. Well, we know how well that worked out for dad. I think she has never felt secure in her life. Maybe it's a self-esteem thing or anxiety from living the way she had to growing up, but I'm afraid she loves material things more than she loves anything else. She seems driven to live the life of the wealthy instead of looking at the wonderful life we have been building full of fun, friendship, trust, and love. Oh Davy, what are you going to do? You have to talk to her and find out what's going on before you overreact or make any big decisions. Beside Dave, you have a $15 million trust fund waiting for you. And as far as I'm concerned, you can start spending it all now if you want. I know mom, but don't you see, that isn't the life I've wanted. And if she is willing to cheat on me and break our marriage vows to presents, then I guess she isn't who I thought she was and I don't want to buy her love for me with a life of riches that I'm not that interested in. To me that much money just creates huge responsibilities and more stress in life, not less. So, what are you going to do honey? I don't know mom, but right now I feel that if she has cheated on me with her boss, then the marriage is dead and it's just a matter of how I end it. If she hasn't, then I'll try and get her to quit her job and go to some counseling with me to find out if she can be happy with the life we're living. She doesn't know about the trust fund and I'm sure as hell not going to let her know about it now. But mom, enough of that. I'm going to take care of you for the weekend, talk to your doctor, and see if we can get you back on the road to health. Molly had tried calling me that entire afternoon and evening and I hadn't bothered to respond or to listen to any of her voicemails. Finally, my mom convinced me that I had to at least let her know where I was and that I was okay, so I agreed and gave her a call. Molly, I see you've been calling me. What do you want? Davy, where are you? I want you, that's what I want. You can't just walk out on me and not let me know you are okay. You have to let me explain. It isn't what you think it is, nothing is going on. Please come home so we can talk about it. Molly, I don't know what to believe right now. I don't think I can believe you when you tell me nothing is going on. How can I possibly think that Sutter is giving you over 10 grand of gifts and that he isn't getting anything in return? Dave, I love you. You need to trust me. I don't want anyone but you. These are just things, and yes, I love them and want them but I want to be with you the rest of our lives. I want to have a family with you and grow old with you. But I want us to be secure and financially sound too. So I really think this job is going to lead to bigger things. Please come home and talk to me. Molly, I can't believe you can't see and understand how inappropriate it is for him to give and you to accept gifts like that. If you haven't done anything yet, he will soon be expecting it and you will feel like you owe him. Davy, it's not like that at all. Money doesn't mean anything to Jay. He has so much. He is just rewarding me for all the hours and hard work. Molly, I really don't know what to believe, but I just have this gut feeling that you aren't being truthful to me and it's burning me up inside. No Dave, don't even think that. Please come home to me and I'll show you that you are the only one. Molly, you can't solve this with sex. Anyway, I need to tell you something. My mom's cancer is back and I'm with her now and I'm going to spend the rest of the week and the weekend here taking care of her and I plan on seeing her doctor on Friday to understand the prognosis. So, you won't see me until at least Monday evening, and if I'm not back by dinner I'll at least give you a call. Oh no, Dave. Oh, that's just so unfair that the cancer came back. Do you want me to come over and spend the weekend with you? I don't want you gone that long, especially when we are in a rough patch like this. I can be there in an hour. No Molly, that isn't a good idea until you and I figure out where our relationship is going. Oh my god Davey, don't even say that. Our relationship isn't going anywhere. I love you, and you love me, and we are meant for each other. Stop thinking like that. Nothing's going on. Please don't think it is. It would kill me to lose you. Molly, 
I've gotta go, so I'll see you on Monday. And when we do talk Molly, be honest with me and we will hash out where we are headed. I hung up feeling like she was saying all the right things but also not really saying anything that answers the question about why he was giving her gifts, why she was accepting them, and if she had slept with him. I had this horrible nagging feeling that she had already broken our wedding vows and she was just trying to figure out how to tell me without losing me. I spent the rest of Wednesday evening and most of Thursday tending to mom, and she was feeling better by Friday when we left to see her doctor. The doctor spent time alone with her doing an exam and update, and after she was finished and came out, he brought me into the office and closed the door. Well, young man, I'm not going to be able to give you much hope, I'm afraid. Your mom told me to be straight with you, and I'll tell you what I told her. I don't think she has more than three to five months to live. The chemo isn't working this time around, and we have no other treatments we can offer her. I've convinced her to try three more courses of the chemo to see if it begins to work, but after that she has told me she is done fighting and just wants to live the rest of her life in peace. When we got back that evening to her house, we cried together as we sat on the couch and I told her how much I loved her. I told her what a great life she had given me and how she was the best mother I could ever imagine, and I meant every word of it. She had always been my ethical compass, the person I could always count on to lead me down the right path in life. We held each other and talked about the good old days of the past but she quickly tired and wanted to go to bed. She pleaded with me to be optimistic and to not let the last months of her life be a pity party for her. She felt lucky to have had a life well lived and told me that I was the best thing she had ever done. She rested up that afternoon and was feeling better by that evening so I got her a movie, put her on the couch and told her I was going out for a while but would be back later. I was a mess. My mom was dying and my wife was likely cheating on me. I felt like getting a bottle of tequila and drowning my sorrows, but I knew drinking myself into oblivion wasn't going to solve anything. Having spent the last several days thinking about the gifts from her boss and the last conversation with Molly, I just couldn't shake the feeling that Molly had cheated on me. Not having any better idea to try and figure this out, I decided to do a drive-by at our house and see if she was home or gone. I got there around 5 o'clock and parked down the block where I could see the front door. Her car was in the driveway and the inner front door was open, so I knew she was home. I was deciding whether to drive up and talk with her now about our issues when a metallic blue Porsche blew by me on the street and pulled into our driveway. As the car went by, I noticed the vanity plate on the rear end that said, Jay's number one. God, what a dork. I thought to myself this shithead must have a really small tool and a huge self-esteem issue. As soon as he pulled in, Molly came out the door, locked up the house and ran to his car. She was dressed to kill. She had on a bright red dress and red 4-inch high heels. She was wearing dark gray stockings, and the dress was so short. The front was so low-cut. This sure as hell wasn't a work outing. I ducked down as they pulled back out and drove by me and was surprised that Molly didn't recognize my car, but I guess she was in awe at sitting in the passenger seat of a $100,000 sports car. I decided to follow them and see where they went. It wasn't far. They drove downtown and stopped at the valet station of Manny's the best steakhouse in town. Sutter got out, walked around the car door and opened Molly's door, and I could almost see when he helped her out of the car. They walked with arms around each other to the entrance of the restaurant and disappeared inside. I found a parking spot on the street and grabbed a hat and jacket and walked to the restaurant and slowly went in. I spotted them in a booth in the back, sitting closely together on the same side with his hand on her thigh as she looked at the wine list. I had to restrain myself from going over and dumping the water carafe on their heads, but instead turned and went back to my car. I sat in the car for two hours, keeping myself occupied by reading various blogs and articles about divorce on my phone. Finally, I saw the valet pull the Porsche up front and they both climbed in. I hoped that this was going to be the end of it, but I had my doubts as I followed them down the street. It didn't take long, and my heart broke as they pulled into the Hilton, again used the valet and Sutter walked around to the passenger door. This time he gave her a long and kiss and squeezed her as he helped her out of the car. She pushed herself tight against him, put her hand behind his head and held him there for that kiss, and I could see them working their tongues in each other's mouths. That was all it took for me to know it was the end of our marriage. There was no way that she could convince me that they weren't screwing, and I didn't need to see it to know it was happening. In fact, I didn't want to see it. I was mad, sad, confused, surprised, and a myriad of other emotions as I slowly drove back to my mom's house. When I pulled up in the driveway, I sat there thinking about how to move forward. I knew divorce was the answer, but she worked for the best divorce firm in the region, so I knew I would get cremated in any divorce. We didn't have that much, given the house was small and not much equity was built up in it. We had limited savings. I made more than her, but not by much, so I figured the alimony if any wouldn't be much. But, 
The one glaring issue was if she and her lawyers discovered the $15 million trust fund, which would certainly happen if, God forbid, my mom passed away before the divorce was finalized. I figured right now it wasn't an issue. It wholly belonged to my mom, and until she passed away it wouldn't be legally recognized as my asset. But the doctor hadn't been optimistic in my private conversation with him that she had more than three months to live, and a divorce usually takes a good six months plus, even longer if the spouse fights it and demands counseling, and takes issue with the asset split and God knows what other bullshit reasons might be drummed up. I was damned if I would let a penny of that money go to Molly, so I needed a plan. I could disappear. Take the money and run, but no way I was walking out on my mom, and no way I wanted to be in contempt of a court order and hiding out hoping not to be found. I could stay in the marriage, ignore Molly, and start playing around on my own and create an open marriage. Not my style, and certainly wouldn't pass mom's ethical compass. I could kill her and Jay Sutter, but I knew that they weren't worth up the rest of my life over, and murder wasn't in my DNA. An idea of a plan started to form in my mind, and although I figured it was a long shot, if I played my part correctly, maybe I could make it work. I would have to bury my hatred and urge for revenge on Molly and Sutter, but if I played the long game, they would eventually get what was coming to them. On Monday evening I drove back to my house, and as soon as I got out of the car, Molly opened the door and ran out to hug me. She tried to give me a kiss, and I pushed her back and told her we had to talk. The look on her face was shock at being refused the kiss, and then dread at the horrible statement of, we have to talk. We walked into the living room, and she took the couch and padded the seat next to her, but I took the armchair across from the couch, which again created a look of sadness and despair on her face. Davy, I missed you so much. You can't leave me like that, I need you. I'm so much in love with you, and I feel so bad that you have the wrong idea about me. I love you. Are you home to stay? And can we drop this talk of suspicion and anger that you have? I looked at her with contempt, that again put a look of fear and shock on her face. Molly, cut the bullshit out and let's have an honest discussion. I know all about your Friday night with Sutter. I saw you at the restaurant, and you were dressed to kill. You certainly never dressed for me like that, but maybe it's because I don't have a Porsche with vanity plates. Molly tried to speak, but I cut her off. Be quiet, Molly. I'm not done. I saw you at the restaurant in the booth with his hand on your thigh, and you practically sitting in his lap. I then followed you to the Hilton and I saw the kiss and groping you two exchanged before heading in to get a room and spend the night screwing. So, let's just cut the bullshit and get on with the dissolution of our marriage. On Davy, no, please God no. I don't love him. I love you. There is no way we are going to end our marriage, I need you. Then why are you screwing him? Why are you disrespecting me that way and cheating on me when you say you love me? Tell me why, damn it. Molly cringed and knew that the only hope she had was the truth. Okay, okay. I'm a gold digger, that's why. I don't mean to be, I don't want to be, but I just can't seem to help it. When Jay started to seduce me with diamonds and iPhones and fabulous dresses and shoes, I just couldn't seem to resist. And all of the exquisite lunches and dinners out, with restaurants that we could only dream about going to and bills that equaled a week's worth of my pay. Yes, god damn it. I did screw him because I wanted him to keep showering me with gifts, money, clothes, and he swore he would get my salary to the very top of where it could possibly go. But Davy, please believe me. I don't love him and I never will. I love and only you. Yes, I want the things he can give me but when I kiss him I almost wretch and when he screws me, I can barely get excited. I am ashamed to say I have faked a lot of them. It's just a transaction, wham bam and we are done. He could never even hold a candle to how you make me feel and I don't love him. But God help me I do love the gifts and feeling like I'm rich when I'm out with him. Oh babe, I'm so sorry and I didn't want to lie to you but I just got caught up in all of the riches and I didn't want to give them up. Oh, I know I sound like a hooker, just screwing him for the gifts and riches he can give me, but that is what happened and now that you know it's helping me with my guilt and my anxiety of being caught. Well Molly, you are definitely caught so now what do you think is going to happen? Are you willing to quit your job, go to counseling and leave your greed behind? and see if we have any remote chance of reconciling? God Davy, please don't ask that. I don't want to lose you, but I don't want to give up the golden cow. Is there any way you can allow me this and just consider it part of my job? You know that when I come home from his pathetic love making, I am so in need of a real man that I attack you and allow you anything. Can I just make it up to you by letting you do anything you want of me, and by me loving you and worshiping you when we are together? Oh God, I know that sounds pathetic, but if you could find it in yourself to allow me that I will definitely make it up to you. Man, Molly, what the hell? How can you ask me that? You want me to cuck myself so that you can enjoy the riches and I get the sloppy seconds? Davy, 
No you don't get the sloppy seconds. When I screw him it means nothing, I feel nothing, and I have no love or excitement being with him. It is strictly the material things he can give me, and the love and friendship and partner in my life is always only going to be you. So, Molly, are you suggesting an open marriage? You screw him. I find other people to screw and enjoy, but we remain married and we come together at night and have sex like nothing's changed? No, Davy. I couldn't stand the idea of you with another woman. I couldn't think about you being with her and maybe having better sex than us. Or you comparing her to me. Or the worst possibility, you falling in love with someone else. I know that is hypocritical, and it probably makes me look pretty shallow, but I don't want an open marriage. I just want to enjoy the things he gives me, pay for them with pathetic meaningless sex, and stay with you. At some point this will be over, and I'll be only yours again. Molly, you really screwed up our marriage in a big way by screwing him. How the hell do you expect me to accept that? What kind of a wuss do you think I am that I would ever consider playing the role of a cuck? I'm so pissed at you right now that I can't even be here, but we sure as hell are going to talk more about this. I'm going to go back and stay with my mom for a few days, and I'll be back on Wednesday to talk more. By the way, are you at least having sex with protection? Oh god yes Davy. There is no way I want to have a mistake pregnancy with him. We always use protection and I won't take the chance of an STD or a pregnancy ever. I'll maybe see you Wednesday Molly. I ripped open the door on my way out and Molly started to sob as she watched me leave. Wait Davy, please, can I screw you now and show you how much I want only you? I need you so bad. Molly, we need to figure out our relationship before we confuse it even more with having sex right now. God, it's like you have lost all sense of reality and I'm so pissed off right now I don't even want to touch you much less screw you. With that I slammed the door on my way out knowing that the first seed of my plan was planted and I would see if I could bring it home on Wednesday. If not, there was no way that I was going to ever screw her again and I would just move on to a divorce. I was disgusted with her and right now I hated her. I hated the lies, the betrayal and I had no respect left for her seeing that the only thing that was really important in her life was the greed and the lust for material things. I didn't even really think she knew if she loved me or what love was but she knew I was the best sex toy she had ever had and if she could combine the gold digger life with Sutter and the happy sex free falls with me, she would have the best of both worlds. But no way I was going to play the role of the cuck. I thought hard about driving right over to Sutter's house and beating the living shit out of him and then dragging Molly to counseling and forcing her to quit the job. But why? She had already lost my love and respect and there was no relationship worth saving in my mind. So at this point it was all about a plan to painlessly and cheaply jettison her out of my life. I had done enough internet research on divorce to know that it would be expensive and leave me in a financial bind. I also figured she would fight any divorce and delay it, and it seemed unlikely that I could divorce her before my mother passed away and the $15 million trust fund was transferred as an asset to me. I had noticed in my research that uncontested, amiable divorces sometimes were granted in three months, especially when the same lawyer represented both parties and the split was agreed and amiable. That possibility was central to my plan. I spent my next several days filling in a few massage appointments to keep some money rolling in, but mostly staying with my mom and tending to her needs. We went through mom's picture albums and we laughed at some of the memories and cried at some of the others but we were together, and I made sure to tell her over and over that I loved her and really appreciated how she had raised me and how great my developing years had been. Wednesday rolled around before I knew it, and I headed over to my house to have another discussion with Molly. When I walked in the door, she was wrapped in a robe but I could see she was wearing stockings and high heels. I thought maybe she had just gotten back from work, so I asked her if this was a good time and she replied, Any time I can be with you is a good time for me Dave. I really missed you and I really don't like how things are between us. We need to fix this. Well Molly, you tell me. Just how would you fix this? Davy, you would move back in here and make love to me four or five times a week like we used to. You would treat me exactly as you used to before you found out about Jay Sutter and I would treat you like my king and do everything and anything you wanted me to do to keep you happy. Yeah Molly, but what about the real issue? What about you and Sutter? Oh Davy, if you could just forget about that. Just let me have that part of my life. Enjoying all of the riches that we can't afford and then I'll come home to you just like I always have and make passionate love to you and enjoy each other's laughter and conversation and just be together like the soulmates we have been until now. Do you love me enough to just let me continue as is? Please baby, I'll really make it up to you. Internally I was repulsed by this. Who the hell was this woman and what had she done with my wife? But, playing the long game I said, Molly, please listen to me carefully and hear me out. This is the way I see it. I think we are a bit at odds. 
You want to enjoy all of the riches, gifts, meals, clothes, all the fancy material things in life that you can get from Sutter. But to do that, you have to screw him, and doing that while you and I are still married makes me a cuck and I won't stand for that. So, I can't agree to what you want. That leaves only a few options. We could have an open marriage, and I can go find a multitude of hot women to screw, but we can stay married and still spend time together, both in and out of bed. No, Davy, I can't agree to that. I just can't let you be with another woman. Okay, then that leaves divorce. Oh my god, no, Dave. I will never divorce you. I'll never let you go. Please, babe, don't even mention that. Well, Molly, if we approach divorce based on adultery and we fight our way through it, we will lose any savings we have at all. We would spend thousands on lawyers. At least I would. Maybe you could use Sutter. I would end up flat broke, with no house and you and I no doubt would destroy any kind of relationship we have left dragging each other through the mud of an ugly, contentious divorce. Then please, Davy, don't even bring it up. That's not a good plan. You need to be in my life. Well, Molly, then please hear me out on this idea. You want the things in life that Sutter can give you. I would imagine Sutter talks to you about leaving me and marrying him. At this statement, Molly turned her eyes away and looked down and whispered, Yes, babe, but I would never. Just hear me out. I am guessing you have been at his house and probably screwed there a few times, right? Molly cast her eyes down again and sobbed a bit and said, Yes, babe, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Molly, listen up. I am guessing his house is amazing. If you did marry him, just think of the riches you would have. Basically, whatever you wanted. An amazing house, redecorated as you want it. An incredible car. Vacations to beach resorts and metropolitan cities that you can now only imagine. Staying in the finest resorts and hotels. Wearing the best clothes, the best jewelry. Eating in the most exclusive restaurants and partying at the most exclusive and expensive clubs. It sounds exactly like the life that you have dreamed about and want and you could have it all. But Davy, I will never leave you. I need you. I told you, he makes me feel good with gifts but our love life is pathetic and we really have no connection like you and I do. I can't give you up. I cringed on the inside wondering how Molly couldn't see that I now felt no connection for her at all. Only contempt that she would throw away what we had for a few measly dollars and trinkets. It made me realize how we really never were close to being right for each other and what a mistake it would be to waste more time in this marriage. Molly, I said with my best salesman's voice I could muster, you wouldn't have to be without me and I wouldn't have to be without you. You and I could have a clandestine affair. We could meet up and share our love and companionship. I would cuck him, just like he is now doing to me. Since he thought it was alright to have an affair with my wife, I guess it would be just be fine for you and I to have a long-term affair that he doesn't need to know about. You get the best of both worlds. You can hang around with me, and we can have exciting and wild sex, and you can get all the riches you could want from him. I could see her considering it, and that made me lose even more respect for her, if that was possible at this point. But how could I get away to see you, and be with you? I work for him, and would be spending all of my time with him at night too. Which now that I think about it sounds pretty dreadful. No Davy, I can't do it. Molly, after you get married you tell him you no longer want to work for him. You tell him you are now an equal partner in the marriage, and you don't want to upset that by having a work relationship. You tell him that you are going to stay home, maybe go to school, work on improving yourself. Then all I have to do is book all of my clients in the evening, and you and I will have every weekday to have sex and hang out all day long. That is how you can have the two things you want. His material possessions and a life of riches. And me as your best friend and lover whenever you need me. I had laid it on pretty thick, but I could see the wheels turning and I knew I had planted a seed that would hopefully sprout. Now I had to lay out the details. Of course, Molly, the only way it would work would be for you and me to have an amiable no-fault divorce where we just split the money we saved. I keep the house so I have a place to live and a place for you to come and make love to me. And we save all our money by having Sutter be the lawyer for both of us. But he is kind of a shark. So you would have to convince him to just let us very quickly and quietly get an amiable divorce approved without him trying to find every nickel we have and get as much as he can for you. It would be really important for us to get divorced quickly, because during the process he would expect us to be separated, and you would still be working for him, and we really couldn't start up our affair until you were married and not working anymore. But I'm guessing Sutter with his connections with judges could get this all done in three months or less. Davy, I don't know. I really don't want a divorce even though I really want his lifestyle. But God, I really don't want him. I'm not sure I could stand living with him and being his wife. Can't you just let me have him on the side and keep things the way they are now? He doesn't mean anything to me, and it will never take anything away from us. I'm sorry Molly, but we went through that. 
You don't want an open marriage, which is the only way we can stay married. I refuse to be a cuck and let him screw my wife while I sit at home. That leaves divorce and we can either do it the hard way where we fight each other, lose everything we own, become bitter enemies and never see each other again. Or we can do it the way I just laid out where you and I are still together through an exciting and secret long-term affair. And you live the life of luxury you want, with Sutter footing the bill. I could see that Molly was struggling and needed time to think it through. I knew she needed incentive, and although it made me sick to think about making love to her, I was going to have to play the part and keep that charade up until she picked either divorce number one or divorce number two. I walked over to Molly and said, I know you have a lot to think about, babe. So let's leave that idea for now, and let's just enjoy what we can have if you pick divorce number two. That allows us to continue to make love, and I think we both need to remember how fantastic that is right now. I guess she was going to try and seduce me into being the cuck, but I pretty much had laid out for her the only path that would keep us together. After two hours, we both lay on the couch, completely satisfied and in a sex fest. Though I had no intention to have sex with my soon-to-be ex-wife, but I had to do it to convince her about the plan we had discussed. Molly, I've got to go back and take care of my mom. She isn't doing well. Think about everything we talked about and let me know how you want to move forward. Can you decide by tomorrow night? I didn't want to give her too much time to think it all through and thought once I got her committed to divorce method too, I could keep pushing the ball down the field and get this done as soon as possible. Davy, I don't know, but please come over tomorrow night so we can repeat what we just experienced. I need you in my life. That was incredible. Molly, now we have a potential plan for how that can happen and it's the only way from my point of view that will work. I'll be back tomorrow night and if we agree on this plan, I will be happy to make sweet, sweet love to you all night long. As I drove back to my mom's I felt a bit guilty, knowing that I was manipulating Molly into a plan that would keep her from getting any of my money and that ultimately would lead to the end of any relationship with us. But she had made her choice and wasn't willing to give up the riches or what she considered the good life. So I had rationalized that she was going to get exactly what she deserved. Mom had remained stable the last week or two, and she had agreed to another few weeks of chemo courses to see if any positive effects could be noticed. She loved having me around, and I tried to make sure that we kept the conversations light and positive and didn't dwell on her health. I got her out for drives, and we drove to some of the parks that she loved to take me to when I was a kid. We would sit on the park bench and watch the kids climbing, wrestling and playing and mom would drift into a relaxing subconscious stupor reliving the days when I was young playing on the swings and slides. Mom had approached me about leaving some money for Molly. I don't think she understood that even though Molly was cheating, she would get half of all our assets in a typical divorce. But I didn't get into any of that and told her I would agree to whatever she wanted to do. We agreed that she could leave her $10,000 and she would be invited to the reading of the will with Mom's lawyer when the time came. The next evening, I visited Molly and asked her if she had come to a decision. She hemmed and hawed before saying that she just wanted things to stay the way they were now. I got up and started to grab my coat and keys and said, well Molly, that just doesn't work for me. So I guess I'll get myself a lawyer and start divorce proceedings. I'll have my lawyer contact Sutter, as I assume you will be using him. God no Dave, what are you saying? Would this be it then for you and me? No babe, I can't allow that to happen. Molly, we went through all of this and there is only one way forward for us. So please, decide what you want to do. Okay, damn it Dave. If that is the only way to keep you and enjoy what Sutter gives me, then I guess it will be divorce number two. I don't like it, and you better make it up to me often and multiple times if you get my drift. With that I picked her up, carried her up to the bedroom. I spent an hour just fondling, kissing and basically worshipping every part of her body. Once again I had sex with my soon-to-be ex-wife as I wanted to make sure that she agrees with next phase of my plan. Oh my god Davy, that was incredible. Maybe the best sex you and I have ever had. Can you spend the night? Yes Molly. I'll spend the night with you, and tomorrow morning we can make sweet love again. We were both relaxed when I said, Molly, I've been thinking about how to get Sutter to represent both of us and quickly get an amiable divorce done. I was also thinking about how you approached the idea of you leaving me and marrying him. I was thinking that maybe we need something to sell him on me leaving you and him helping us get this done. What did you have in mind, Dave? I think I need to somehow get some video of you two being intimate that I can use to entice him to represent us both. I could set up a hidden camera here in our bedroom and you could lure him up here for a quick sex when he comes to pick you up for a date. Then a few days later, you would tell him that I know all about you two. You would tell him that I had been suspicious and had hidden a camera in the bedroom. Tell him that I suggested you quit and we go to counseling but then you tell him that you said no, that you choose him. Soon after I could approach him with the video and convince him I would go to the paper and social media with it if he didn't get us a quick, no-fault divorce. 
Oh no, Davy. I don't want you to see him and me together. Wouldn't that break your heart? Molly, yes, it would be hard, but I'm trying to save our relationship with the plan of becoming your lover after you marry him, and I think this would push it through. I'll get the camera and set it up in our bedroom, and all you have to do is get him to come up, give you a quick sex, and then I can use it to gently convince him to represent us both and push through a free no-fault divorce. We ended our discussion with another raging session of sex, and although I was still feeling a bit guilty about the manipulation I was using on Molly, I had decided that she was the one who had thrown away my love, our marriage, and she should get the life lesson she deserved. I really struggled with being intimate with her at this point, knowing she was screwing Sutter too, but the way I made it through was by strictly having savage, wild sex with her. There was no more lovemaking, no looking into each other's eyes and professing our love, no cuddling and holding each other after we were finished. It was strictly a race to get our rocks off, get a reasonable number of pleasures, and move on. I continued to go back to my mom's house most evenings, hoping to comfort and spend time with her, but there certainly was a degree of avoiding any more time with Molly than was necessary. She never talked to me about Sutter and her job anymore, and I felt that she was embarrassed about the affair and her situation, but just not enough to give up the riches that she so highly coveted. By the next Friday, I had positioned a camera in our master bedroom and laid out the plan for Molly. She was to tell Sutter I was working late and then spending the weekend with my mom, and that Sutter should pick her up Friday evening for a nice dinner and dancing date. I was parked down the street when the a-hole in his Porsche with the stupid vanity plates drove by and pulled into the driveway. Molly brought him into the house, and they were inside for 40 minutes before coming back out, so I was pretty confident they had done the deed. When they left in his car for their night on the town, I went into the house and retrieved the SD cards from the camera, downloaded it into my PC, erased the content, and removed the camera. Reviewing and editing the content, I could see why Molly was so excited when she was done with him. Well, that's what she was signing up for, and to me it was obvious now that it was all about the gold. I certainly didn't give their marriage much chance of success, and wasn't sure if Sutter would use a prenup to protect himself or not. Honestly, I didn't give a shit. Knowing Molly's sex drive, she wouldn't put up with him as her only sexual outlet for long. Of course, she was betting on me. The next morning, I came over to see Molly and told her that it was time to unleash the plan. Molly, you need to call him, tell him that I have been suspicious and that I had wired our room for sound and video and caught you having sex in our master bed. Then tell him that I asked you to go to counseling but in your mind our marriage is over because you love him and want to be with him. Just leave it at that and then I'll take it from there. Oh Davy, I just don't know about this. Can't we just let all of this divorce plan go and just keep doing what we have been doing? You know that I'll make you feel so good every night and we can still hang out all the time and be together. So, I get a few gifts from Sutter. I just look at that as a bonus for the work I do for him. Molly, you only get those things if you are screwing him. And there is no way I'm letting that pompous rich cuck me and screw my wife. We've been through this time after time, and this is the only way. Unless you want me to pack up and be out of your life for good. No, no, no. I definitely don't want that. I just wish you would let me have it all. If you really loved me, you would just let this continue. Until I get bored with it. Molly, I could say that if you really loved me, you would have never done this. It's too late for any of this talk. Do you want to continue? Or should we just split ways here? God Davy, you are so stubborn. I don't want to do this, but if it is the only way left for us, then I guess I have to. I'll talk to Jay today about the divorce and about him, and I being a couple, just like you said. I called Molly later that night from my mom's house to ask her how it went. Dave, he just freaked out. He was so worried that you were going to come after him. He also is totally freaked out about that video getting out. It would ruin his reputation and affect his practice if people knew he had seduced his personal assistant and had broken up a marriage in the process. Yeah, Molly, and just think if I brought it up to the American Bar Association. I mean, maybe he would lose his license to practice, at least for a while. Oh God, don't do that. The riches would stop coming in. I thought to myself, figures that would be her first concern. God, what a greedy witch. But I didn't say it and instead I told her, Molly, I'm going to contact him and get the wheels rolling on the divorce. I think to sell this you should tell him that I moved in with my mom until this all gets settled. Besides, she is starting to go downhill and she really needs my support now. I'll see you when I can, probably not until the weekend at best. I set up a meeting with Sutter as a potential client under a false name and warned Molly not to be at the office at 4.30 on the day I planned to confront him. She complied and someone else let me into his office and announced to him that a Mr. Jones was here to see him. He stood up, all smiles, and it took every bit of willpower I had not to smash in his front teeth and kick him in the balls. 
It would be fun to just tear into him, and I couldn't imagine an easier target to beat the shit out of, but I had to stick to the plan. I ignored his hand when he reached out to shake mine and said, Mr. Sutter, thanks for meeting me. First of all, my name is actually Dave Jacobs, and my wife is Molly Jacobs, your personal assistant that you have been screwing. I put a lot of anger and menace into my opening statement, and he looked stunned at first, and then scared. He quickly retreated behind his desk. Now Mr. Jacobs, don't even think about getting physical or you'll end up in jail, and it will cost you a lot of time and money to get out. Listen, I'm sorry about what happened. I didn't mean to fall in love with Molly, and for her to fall in love with me. But it happened, and we just couldn't keep ourselves apart once we understood that we were true soulmates. You probably don't want to hear that, and I know you would like to punch me in the face right now, but again, that would be a major mistake. Why the hell are you here? Sutter, you know that Molly has chosen you over me, and has refused to work on our marriage. So, I guess you win. However, I'm not going to just fall on my sword, unless you help me out. With that I handed him a USB stick and said, you can look at this in your spare time, but basically it shows you and Molly having sex in my house and in my master bedroom. Sutter, there are two ways that we can move forward. The worst case scenario is that I fight Molly on the divorce, I get a lawyer and she'll retain you or one of your staff, and it becomes a drag out fight. I take this video and send it to the paper, to social media sites, to the bar association, to your parents and friends. Basically, anyone I can think of in an attempt to ruin you. Now Jacobs, hold on. That will damage Molly too. And do you really want to do that to the woman you love? Also, how will you feel knowing everyone knows your wife cheated on you? There must be another idea on your mind. So get to it. Yes, Sutter. There is. I know that I have lost Molly to you. So, I basically want to quickly dissolve this sham of a marriage and move on. But I don't want to lose everything in the process. And I want Molly to be okay when this is all done. You don't have to worry about Molly Jacobs. I'm going to take real good care of her, and yes, I want your marriage to end quickly too so Molly and I can move forward together. Well then my proposal to you, Sutter is this. You represent both Molly and me in a no-fault, uncontested divorce. We can split our savings, which is virtually nothing, but I keep the house. Which again has virtually no equity, maybe $10,000 at the top of the potential market price. Who knows, it might even be underwater at this point. Regardless, you just take the asset list from me, write it up as a split down the middle, get us divorced in less than three months, and it's no charge to me or Molly. If you agree, then we won't have to get into all the ugly battles and mudslinging that will happen if my terms aren't met. So, Jacobs, that's it? I represent you both, no charge, split everything besides the house 50 50ths, and you're done? Yes, but don't forget, the clock is running. I want to be out of the state and into a new life in less than three months. You would probably like me gone too, so you can feel confident that I won't be around to screw up here in Molly's new life. I am guessing you have a few judges that are friendly to you, and if you ask, and they know that it is a non-contentious divorce, they will get it recorded and done quickly. Yeah, Jacobs, I can make that happen. Okay, let me confirm with Molly, but if she is on the same page as you, we have a deal. Just send me the asset list, and I'll get started immediately on the paperwork. I'll have you served next week. You just sign and return the papers to me and we'll be on our way. I stood up, trying to keep the smile off my face, and with a look of disgust I turned and walked towards the office door saying, I won't pretend to shake your hand as my instinct would be to snap your wrist. I'm counting on you to make it happen, so we can both get on with our lives. When I got home, I sent Sutter the asset list, and then I updated Molly on where we were at. She looked drawn out and haggard, and when she finally spoke, I felt a tinge of guilt, but again reminded myself that this was the bed she made and now she would have to lie in it. Dave, I am feeling so confused about this whole plan. I know that Sutter will now want me to stay over at his place and put the pressure on about spending more and more time together as a couple. I'm not sure I can deal with that. I didn't really want her living full-time with Sutter if I was going to still have to be her sex partner for three months, so I made a suggestion. Molly, why don't you tell Sutter that you don't feel right living as a couple until you are divorced and until you and Sutter are married? Tell him I have moved in with my mom, which by the way really isn't a lie. She has gone off the chemo now, and is getting weaker and weaker, and I need to spend as much time as possible with her. So, tell Sutter you are staying alone at the house, and you can still date him in secret, but you don't want the office or the general public to know until our divorce is final. When I got back to mom's house, she was on the couch watching TV. She said she felt weak, but actually felt better without the chemo treatments. She insisted on talking about the funeral, what song she wanted sung, who should be there, who she wanted to do scripture readings, and what I thought I would say in my eulogy. I had to leave the room before the tears erupted. Life could be just so unfair. 
Molly was pretty demanding over the next several months about me coming back to the house and servicing her sexual needs. Every time I came over there were more blatant evidence of gifts she had gotten from Sutter. Fancy lingerie, jewelry, expensive high heels, even a mink coat. The last time I pulled up she had a fancy Volvo SUV in the driveway and told me it was her company car. Quite frankly I was disgusted, but didn't want to discuss anything that would rock the boat. I strictly showed up to do my part as her sexual toy. Maybe my anger manifesting itself in our sex. I started to just do what I wanted with her, and I had recently taken to having more wild sex with her than standard sex, knowing that Sutter would find it disgusting. I was served divorce papers at home, and that started an eruption of tears and second thoughts for Molly, but we weathered that storm and kept moving forward. The months slowly ticked by and for me the depression and pain I was in about my mom's failing health was my only real emotion left. I was so done with Molly that I spent as little time as I possibly could at our house, telling her I needed to spend every day I could with my mom. Finally, the day came when Sutter sent me an email with a dissolution of marriage document attached. He told me it was final. We were officially divorced and I should move on with my life and stay away from Molly. He told Molly the same thing and she left the office that day feigning sickness and rushed home to make love to me but I was gone. She called and I didn't pick up the phone. I was done, and now, it was just a matter of how to clue her in that the relationship was dead. I had set up a meeting time with her for Saturday morning, but that was the beginning of the worst day in my life. My mom had passed out that morning at the kitchen table, and I couldn't revive her. I called 911, and an ambulance came, and collected her and I followed them to the hospital. I texted Molly with what had happened and cancelled our morning meeting, and told her I would stay in touch. Mom died later that night in the hospital. She never did gain consciousness, and she just left her body quietly in the middle of the night. I was holding her hand as she took her last breath. I went back to mom's house and cried myself to sleep, and the next day I forced myself to implement all the funeral details that mom had been so adamant about planning. The funeral was four days later, and in my eulogy, I spent time talking about the love that mom showered on me, and the priceless gems of wisdom she had given me over the course of my life. The church was her bastion of peace, hope, and grace. And I told the pastor that a very large gift would be coming to the church in the near future, per my mom's wishes. I had texted Molly about mom's funeral and asked her not to come. I kept ignoring her calls, but knew I was just putting off the inevitable confrontation. I finally had the perfect opportunity to end it all when mom's lawyer called me to set up a reading and execution of the will. The lawyer also asked for Molly's number, as my mom had left her a cash gift of $10,000. I called Molly and told her about the details of mom's passing and funeral. Molly told me that she was now engaged to be married, and she said that with mom's passing she wanted to cuddle and love me and show her support. She also said that it was time now to start up our affair and start meeting regularly so she could get the loving and comfort out of me on the side while she got the material things out of Sutter. I told her about the reading of the will and asked her to be at the lawyer's office the next day at 10 so we could hear and execute the will that mom had left. She agreed, but was confused about why she would need to be there. I told her that mom had left her a gift and the estate administrator wanted to execute mom's wishes. An estate administrator? I thought all that your mom really had was the house and some social security. So, I guess it won't be much but what a wonderful blessing for her to think of me. I wasn't a very good daughter-in-law, and especially avoided her after cheating on you with Sutter. I feel guilty about that and about everything, but now we can put all of that behind us and start our love life up again. See you at 10 tomorrow Molly, I spit out as I abruptly ended the call. My pain, Anger and disgust were raising to the surface, but I knew that I was now reaching the end and I would soon start my new life. At the reading of the will, Molly and I were led into a fairly opulent conference room at the law firm of Jenkins, Jenkins, and Mallory, attorneys at law. We took seats on opposite sides of the big conference table as Jenkins won. The old man opened up the will and started. He looked at Molly and said, Molly Jacobs, your ex-mother-in-law has left you the sum of $10,000 to be paid to you today with no other provisions attached. She asked me to tell you one piece of wisdom and that is this. Remember that the good life isn't really about money, so look hard at what you have and what is of importance, and don't be fooled by objects that are just trinkets of fleeting beauty. Molly cringed when she heard the thinly concealed scolding from her dead mother-in-law via the lawyer, but she held her tongue. With that Jenkins handed her a check, told her to use the money wisely, and then turned to me. David Jacobs, your mother has laid out the following instructions for the balance of her estate. You are to receive the house, valued at $500,000 and mortgage-free to do with as you wish. A sum of $1 million has been gifted to the Church of Christ for use as they see fit. 
A sum of $4 million has been gifted to the American Breast Cancer Society for help in researching and eliminating breast cancer. And a sum of $9.5 million, the balance of her estate, is gifted to you, her only heir, and will be transferred this week to whatever account you give me. I am very sorry for your loss. With that he got up and walked out of the room, leaving Molly and I alone. When I looked over at Molly, her jaw was wide open and she was breathing hard. I think she was in shock, and finally what was happening dawned on her, and she looked at me with an angry, painful and confused look. What the hell Dave? Your mom was rich? You had to have known your mom was rich, didn't you? Oh yeah, Molly, I've known since my grandparents died a decade ago that I would ultimately receive a large trust fund from them. My mother hardly touched the money for her own use. Dave, this is wonderful. Now we are rich and I can dump that boring, disgusting Sutter and we can get back together. Molly, how clueless are you? You and I are finished. The first time you broke our wedding vows and screwed Sutter, just like a hooker would do, for some jewels, dresses, and fancy meals, you became dead to me. You are nothing but a gold digger, and frankly your behavior disgusts me. I engineered the quick divorce so your grubby, greedy hands couldn't get any of the money I was going to inherit and I knew from the first time I saw you and Sutter go into the Hilton together that you and I were over, and it was just a matter of time till I could get you out of my life. Molly recoiled from my outburst and anger as tears came to her eyes and as I stared at her with disgust. I continued yelling at her. Now on a roll, fueled by my pent-up anger over her cheating, my mom's death, and how unfair life can be. You took the love I had for you and sold it for cheap to a boring, desperate, lonely, rich guy that you don't have one ounce of respect or love for. You were more interested in material things than in a life with me. You claim to love me, but look deep and you will understand you only love yourself, and you're only really interested in trying to be rich. Well, there is no way that I was going to give you any access to this money after I saw your true personality. We are done, and my plan is to walk out of this office and never look at you again. God damn you Dave. How could you? You set me up. Why didn't you help me? Yes, I have a need for money and things. You know how I grew up. We had nothing. No one respected us, we were treated like dirt. I had it baked into me at a young age, and throughout my life that you are only worthy if you have money. But I love you Dave, I really do. You should have showed me our possible future. That's bullshit Molly. Oh yeah. I guess I do understand you probably believe that only money earns respect. But I respected you for you. Or who I thought you were. I loved you just the way you were and I showed you that each and every day. We had something beautiful until you got bored with our average middle class life and needed more. You still don't get it. You sold out our love, our friendship, and any chance of a life together for a measly few riches. When you get married and live with Sutter and have all the things you want, but realize you have no spark or happiness in your life. Maybe then you'll see that possessions are the least important things in a well-lived life. You have sold yourself like a common 304 for things that will be of little comfort to you. I am totally disgusted with you and could never share my love with you again. Maybe it's not too late for you. Quit Sutter, quit work, go out on your own and try and find what will make you happy. That's what I'm doing. I'm off to California to start a new life and see if I can't eventually find someone who wants just me, without caring about the life of money and jewelry, but instead based on a life of love, respect, and friendship. I wish you luck, and I'll try and remember you as the beautiful young wife I loved before your greed destroyed us. Molly was slumped down in her chair, listening to me with a shocked and pained look on her face, and then she burst into tears and put her head down on the table and sobbed. Oh God, what have I done? I felt horrible, but it was over and I had to leave before I said more. So I got up and in a gentler voice told her, I'm sorry Molly but there is no way forward for us. Good luck and goodbye. I turned and practically ran out of the room and down to my car. I drove back to my mom's house and had one more action in my plan to execute. I took the video of Sutter screwing Molly and sent it to the American Bar Association with a cover letter explaining what he had done. I then sent the same letter and video to a few of his employees that I had been in contact with regarding the divorce and to the National Enquirer asking them to dig into the story of a divorce attorney who ruined a marriage by seducing an employee, then handled a quick self-serving no-charge divorce to get rid of the husband so he could marry her. Yeah, I lied to Sutter about our deal. I figured, screw him. He seduced my wife with money and power. He deserved to get some payback for his actions. I was sad that this would probably also tear Molly down even further, maybe even end her chance to marry Sutter, but I had been screwed over by both of them and my pain demanded some payback before I moved on. Hopefully that would be the last time I would even think about Jay Sutter again. 
Dave Jacobs sold both houses, packed up the few items that were of importance to him, and moved out west to San Diego to start a new life. He opened his own massage and physical therapy office, along with a Pilates and yoga studio with the latest equipment for treating physical ailments and rehabilitation. About two years after he was established, he started to date one of the contract Pilates instructors that had the body of a goddess and the personality of a saint. Their relationship blossomed into one of total love and dedication, and they decided to marry and share their love forever. They had a boy and a girl over the next few years, and spent as much time as possible as a family enjoying the simple things in life. Surfing, biking, hiking, camping, and expressing love and respect for each other. Dave never knew just how fantastic real love could be until he had a family to care for. Jay Sutter did not lose his license, but he did lose several employees, and a lot of respect and friendship amongst his peers and other contacts. He became something of a running joke. The Inquirer did write up a story on him, and he suffered a great deal of embarrassment and harassment for several months until it died down, And but the story continued to come up when someone did a Google search of him or firm. His law practice and his bookings took a severe dip due to the negative fallout, and his firm was no longer in the top 25 firms in the region two years later. Molly and Sutter got married, but he was smart enough to make Molly sign a prenuptial agreement prior to the wedding that stated if either party was involved in any infidelity, that the wedding would be dissolved and you were left with whatever assets you brought to the marriage. Molly was forced to quit working, as none of the employees at the firm had any respect for her, and she was treated like a common 304 by her peers. She became a stay-at-home wife, bored out of her mind. The only thing more boring than her days were the nights she had to submit herself to having sex with Sutter. Oh, she did indeed spoil herself with purchases of clothes, jewelry, trips, cars, fancy meals. But none of it really made her feel any better. Life with Sutter became an endurance contest, and she didn't last long. Twelve months from the day of their marriage, Sutter came home in the middle of the workday and found her in his bed with one of the junior lawyers from his firm. He immediately kicked her out and fired the lawyer on the spot. Divorce quickly followed, and the last time anyone heard from her she had moved out east and was trying to start a new life. In her new life, she had just enough money after living expenses to occasionally go out and enjoy a reasonable dinner or a girl's night out, but she found herself feeling more joy in this life than anything she came near to with Sutter. She still missed and loved Dave, but she finally understood what a mess she had made of her life, losing the one person that she loved and considered a soulmate for the unfulfilling ownership of a few jewels and fine clothes. Perhaps she was really starting to understand that the good life isn't just about money. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.